Hello, and welcome to tonight's Berea College Convocation, which is co-sponsored by KELTS, the Center for Excellence in Learning Through Service. My name is Kaylee Raymer, and I'm a 2017 graduate of Berea College and a former student worker at KELTS. I'm coming to you today from Louisville, Kentucky, where I work as a public defender. I will be your moderator for this evening, so please use the Q&A feature to share your questions with us. Before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Rigo, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rigoberto Moreno. I am a senior education major, and I hold a labor position in Kelt as a program manager of Berea Tutoring. Part of the job of becoming an educator and tells a responsibility to advocate for those who can offer him or herself. Such a task has been taken by today's speaker, Desmond Mead. Truly an inspiration to all, Mr. Mead carries with him a list of accolades and accomplishments that one could only dream to achieve in a lifetime. From being the president of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, chair of Floridians for a Fair Democracy, a graduate of Florida International University College of Law and being named to Time's top 100 most influential list. He has done it all. Mr. Mead is also the recipient of the 2020 uh, Berea College Service Award, which recognizes individuals who have provided outstanding service to our society in achieving the ideals of Berea's great commitments. We look forward to honoring Mr. Mead with the presentation of this award in person at a future date. At the core of everything, Mr. Mead has kept the idea of equality for all with a heart full of hope, not to mention the idea of a second chance in life. No one mistake defines us all. His relentless fight for social equality has made him an example for all. So without further ado, I present to you all this Mead. So well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Rigoberto and, and Kaylee. And I definitely want to thank uh, the College of Berea for actually inviting me to uh, be able to present uh, to the faculty, staff, and students that are listening this evening. Uh, it's definitely an honor to be here. I wish I could have been there in person. I was looking forward to it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have this thing called COVID-19. Uh, but in spite of that, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, life goes on and, and we're actually given this opportunity, even though it might be a lot of despair, might be a lot of uh, tensions around our country, around race, and so many other things that uh, I do believe that we are in a moment to emerge from this uh, pandemic and to emerge from these uh, 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 tensions. Uh, really as with a renewed sense of democracy, with a renewed sense of, of understanding about how we are all God's children and how we are all deserving uh, to be treated with dignity and respect. You know, my orientation uh, to the work that I do and why I am where I am today and doing the things that I'm doing really started back in August of 2005. I remember that day very well because it was one of those hot and humid days in South Florida. And I tell folks, and, and not for a joke, but I used to tell folks that it was so hot and humid that I remember uh, watching a dog chase a cat and they were both walking. You know, but, you know, for a moment I was able to block out that heat and humidity because at the time I was standing in front of railroad tracks waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. That day as I stood there, I was a broken man. I was, I was homeless. I was addicted to drugs. I was unemployed. I was recently released from prison and I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. You know, and I know that my parents didn't raise me to be in that position, but there I was and I, I waited and I waited. I was ready. You know, I, I'm a person that I'm scared of needles. You know, and I thought about how when this train hit me, was I gonna die instantly or, or was I gonna experience moment of, moments of agonizing pain? But even the thought of the pain that I may have had to endure 
was not enough to make me move and I stood there. That was it, no more self-esteem. I was ready to go. But God had other plans and, and for some reason, you know, that train didn't come that day and I eventually crossed those tracks and I checked myself into drug treatment. And after completing drug treatment, I moved into a homeless shelter. And while living at the homeless shelter, I decided that I wanted to do something to not use drugs again. That was my original motivation for going to school. You know, I figured if I did something to uh, uh, raise my self-esteem, I might not relapse. You see, because I was a person that had been addicted to drugs for quite a number of years and had been homeless for quite a number of years. And I know that this is a cycle of drug use where you would use drugs and get to a very low place and you may stop and your life start to improve and then something happens that triggers a relapse. And, and before you know it, you're right back where you were or even in a worse place. And I didn't want to go through that cycle again because I believe that if I were to approach railroad tracks again, this time I wouldn't be as lucky. And so I enrolled at a local college, I enrolled in the paralegal program. I ended up graduating at the top of my class. Uh, after completing uh, paralegal studies, my, my professors, they encouraged me to continue my education. And so I pursued a bachelor's degree in public safety management with a concentration in criminal justice. Now I chose this uh, field because I figured since I had a lot of experience getting arrested uh, by the police and a lot of experience appearing before judges in court that somehow or another that would parlay into classroom success. And it actually did. And I ex uh, ended up graduating with highest honors with my bachelor's and eventually I was accepted into Florida International University's College of Law in May of 2014. I graduated with a law degree. You know, many times I've told that story and many times I've said that, you know, in spite of everything that I've been able to overcome, you know, in spite of the obstacles that I've been, uh, I've had to navigate, that because I live in the state of Florida, my story really didn't have a, a happy ending, primarily because, you know, I've graduated law school and I have a law degree, but I can't practice law because in Florida, if you've ever been convicted of a felony offense, any felony offense, you lose your civil rights for the rest of your life. And you need your civil rights restored in order for you to even apply to sit for the Florida bar. And so in spite of the work that I've done in college and, and, and the grades that I've been getting, I couldn't even sit for the Florida bar. But I think the biggest blow uh, was not me uh, was, was me not being able to sit for the bar, but rather the fact that my wife ran for office in 2016 and I couldn't even vote for it. Even though I looked around the country and seen people uh, that had access to the voting booth, uh, I even read a story to where prisoners in Puerto Rico uh, was able to participate in elections. And I knew in, in the states of Maine and Vermont that people never lose their rights. And so I'm seeing uh, citizens throughout the country being able to vote if they chose to, uh, but because I lived in Florida, I was barred from voting. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I'm telling you, that was a blow to me uh, because I believe that nothing speaks more to citizenship than being able to vote, right? Uh, and that by, by voting, you're saying that not only are you a part of democracy, not only are you a citizen of this country, but your voice matters. That, your, that, that you as an individual, you have the power to make a difference in what goes on in your community, what goes on in your state, what goes on in your country. And so at, what, at some point, I was inspired to launch a citizen's initiative in the state of Florida. And that uh, initiative basically restored voting rights to individuals after they have completed their sentence. Um, it was a hard fought citizens initiative. Uh, as a matter of fact, I loved every minute of it, even though it was hard fought. And eventually in May, I'm sorry, in uh, November of 2018, we successfully passed a uh, citizens initiative amendment Four, which restored voting rights to 1.4 million Floridians 
Uh, now, let me tell you the significance of that. Prior to passing Amendment 4, because of Florida's policies, which were born out of the Jim Crow era, we had over 1.68 million people who faced a lifetime ban from voting. To put that number in perspective, that's more people than the population of over 10 US states and territories. And that's a population of, uh, of, of, that's larger than I think at least about 40 to 50 countries in the world. And the state of Florida accounted for at least a quarter of all of the individuals in the entire United States that could not vote because of a felony conviction. Now, when folks think of felonies, they think of, sometimes they think of the worst things like murder and, and some atrocious crimes. But the reality is, is that the overwhelming majority of people uh, that uh, lost their right to vote, lost their civil rights, lost it because of crimes much less serious than that. You know, in the state of Florida, you're able to lose the right to vote for driving with a suspended license. You're able to lose the right to vote for catching a lobster whose tail is too short or disturbing turtle nesting eggs or trespassing on a construction site. And one of my favorites was, you know, a gentleman on Valentine's Day, rather than giving his wife a dozen red roses, he decided to release a dozen red balloons in the air. And he happened to be seen by a law enforcement officer and he was promptly arrested and charged with a third degree felony. And if he were to have been convicted, he would have lost the right to vote for the rest of his life. And there's just something inherently wrong with that. And so by passing Amendment 4, we created a pathway for individuals to be able to vote again without having to rely on the mercies of their governor through clemency power. Now, I, you know, a lot of folks always talk about the 1.4 million and talk about how great it was because it was the largest expansion of voting rights uh, since the civil rights era. So for over 50 years, uh, we haven't seen anything like that before. And, and with something like that happening in the state of Florida, such a pivotal state, a lot of attention was focused on the votes. But where my attention lied was actually on how we did it, right? Which I thought was uh, even greater than re-enfranchising 1.4 million people. You know, I like to tell folks that, you know, when you talk about restoring voting rights to people with felony convictions, that is a very uh, controversial topic, right? But then when you talk about doing it in a state like Florida, which some people think is three states in one, it's a very controversial state. And then when you talk about doing it during the controversial times, when there's so much hate and division uh, that we see in our country and the political climate was ripe with tensions, you know, all of the experts uh, told me and told others that there is no way that something like this would even make it on the ballot in Florida, much less pass. Uh, but we defied all odds. And how we defied all odds was by really connecting with people, other human beings, around, along the lines of humanity, that we took this issue and we were able to elevate it above partisan politics. We were able to elevate it above racial anxieties and implicit racial biases and connect with each other along the lines of humanity. And so on that night in November, when we passed Amendment 4, you know, the most beautiful thing that I seen was the fact that we had over a million more votes for our amendment than for any other candidate that was on the ballot. And those 5.1 million votes that we received, they were not votes that was based on hate. They were not votes that was based on fear, but rather they were votes that was based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And the whole world, the state of Florida, actually got to see love winning the day. And I think that that's where you know, deep down inside of each and every one of us. I think that's a space that we aspire to be. Well, we aspire to be in a community, in, in, in a state, in a country, to where there are not so much tensions and there's not so much hate uh, that's being thrown back and forth and not so much division, but rather a community that comes together and helps each other out. And we see it all the time. 
You know, um, we see it after natural disasters. We see it uh, during car accidents. We see it during moments of crisis when, you know, all else is thrown out the window and what we see is another human being, another child of God uh, that, that's hurting. Well, how did, how did I get there? How did we get, how did I get to this space uh, where I understood that the greater importance was how to bring people together uh, rather than, than to divide them? How to move major policy issues, right, with people from all walks of life and all political persuasions in a, in a, 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 a tense political climate that we're in even now, right? And I think that that, that, that journey actually started when I crossed those tracks, right? When I remember when I, immediately after I crossed the tracks, I had asked myself, I stopped and I looked at the tracks and I asked myself, if I were to have died, if a train would have came and I would have jumped in front of it and I would have died that day, how many people would come to my funeral? And the immediate answer was zero because I was homeless and I didn't have any identification. I would have been buried in a pauper's grave. And I didn't like that. And so I changed the facts around and, and, and I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm killed by the train. But the local newspaper, the Miami Herald, would have my picture on the front page, top of the fold, with bold headlines, Desmond killed by train. How many people would come? And I thought long and hard, but I could only come up with four people. And out of those four people, maybe two would have shed a tear. Now that thought hit me in the gut like a Mike Tyson blow, and it took the wind out of me. And it made me question my existence, right, on this planet. And I asked myself, like, Desmond, you mean to tell me after all these years of, of living on this earth and having these different relationships and living different places, only four people would care if you died? Have your life been that insignificant? And I remember taking those questions with me when I entered into drug treatment. And within a month after being there, Rosa Parks passed away. And I remember watching as they had her body lay and stayed in the return of the Capitol and seeing so many people uh, uh, come to pay their final respects. And so many of them had tears in their eyes and something just overcame me. And I remember jumping out of my seat and screaming at the television saying, that's it, that's it. Pointing like a madman saying, that's what I wanted. Right. And I was actually starting to plan my own funeral. My mind was racing and I wanted to have a funeral like Rosa Parks. I wanted people to mourn me. I wanted to feel like I was somebody or, or I was significant. Not just this guy that is, is killed by a train and only four people showed up. And so I, 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 my mind was racing and I, 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 I ended up finding a venue. I wanted my funeral to be held at the Dolphin Stadium. Uh, uh, where, they, uh, where the football team plays, and I wanted every seat, every seat filled. I wanted not one dry eye in the house. And my, the only problem I came up with was, how can I get so many people to come to my funeral? And, and uh, you know, I thought for a while, and I came up with two options, an a athlete or a movie star. And I didn't think I was, old, uh, I was too old to be an athlete. And I definitely didn't think I was handsome enough to be a movie star. And, and the only reason I thought I wasn't handsome enough because at the time, all I could think about was Danzel Washington. Now I knew I wasn't a bad looking guy, but you know, I knew I wasn't a Danzel Washington. And I tell folks today that thank God I didn't think of somebody like Forrest Whitaker because I knew I'm much better looking than him. And if I would have thought of him, maybe I would have believed that I had a career as an actor but I didn't, I thought of Danzel. And, you know, I was like, well, I can't do that. But my mind went back to Rosa Parks and she talked about, you know, and I thought about how, you know, and she was just an ordinary person that committed a simple act that ended up, I guess, causing repercussions that we feel all the way up to the day uh, because of that act. And I thought maybe if I could take all of that pain that suffering, that low self-esteem that led me to the railroad tracks, that somehow or another, if I could package it in such a way to where I'm able to help someone else so they don't have to go to those railroad tracks and they can help others and so on and so on, 
pretty soon I would have a lot of people uh, that if I were to have died would have said, man, I'm sad because Desmond really made an impact in my life. And so that's what I set out to do. And in doing so, I end up discovering what God purpose for me was. And that was just to give back. You know, when I looked at everything that God created, everything in nature, it took a little and it gave a little. And so I dedicated my life to doing everything within my power to do, to, to, to do the things that needed to be done to make my community a much better place. And that path took me down, uh, uh, took me down the pathway to joining uh, the organization of which I'm now the executive director and to do the work that we're doing today. And you know, one of the things that um, uh, Rigoberto mentioned when he introduced me, he talked about you know, me being um, honored by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And I remember when I got that notification, and I was with my wife, Sheena, and I asked her, I said, you know, are they talking about in the country? And she looked at me and said, no, baby, they're saying the world. And my only response to her was, honey, there are more than 100 countries in the world. You know, I was just, I was blown away that, you know, and, and then when I found out the people who were also uh, made that list, you know, I was really like shocked. But then something came over me and, and, and I kind of changed my approach uh, to this time 100 because, and I remember going to the gala and talking to the folks and I was like, you know, you shouldn't have had the rock on that cover. You should have, you should have put me on that cover. And it wasn't because I was, you know, being conceited. It wasn't because I wanted the notoriety. It was because I believe that me being on the cover, me being named time 100 most influential in the world, that it says to so many people that you don't have to be a movie star to make a difference. You don't have to be a celebrity to make a difference in your community, you know, in your state, or even to be the, one of the most influential people in the world. Because if someone like me, who was a drug addict and homeless and, and, and was ready to commit suicide, could end up becoming one of the 100 most influential people in the world, then that means that each and every one of you all that's looking at me right now or listening to my voice each and every one of you have that very same potential to impact the world in which we live. And I, you know, and my message to you is that we do so, but we do so with love. We do so by wanting for our neighbor what we would want for ourselves. We do so not by dividing people and not by moving people or motivating people through hatred or through fear, but rather by motivating people through love. Right, and it's gonna take some work uh, because loving is hard work, uh, but it's a work that's worthwhile. It's a work that will make a difference uh, in so many people's lives. And it's a work that will make our society a much better place to live. And so once again, I wanna thank Berea College for inviting me. And I am really looking forward to the questions that you all have. And I wanna say that please, do not hesitate to ask me anything. I am an open book. I don't think that any question is, is too controversial or even too personal. I am at your disposal, ready, willing, and able to answer any question that you have. Thank you once again. Thank you. So we're gonna get started. We already have some questions. Um, the first question is, do formerly incarcerated people um, who owe fines even oftentimes know they owe the fines? And how would someone go about finding out that information? Yeah, so that is, um, that's one of the, the challenges uh, that we've had over the past year. Uh, one primarily being that the state of Florida does not have a centralized system in which a, a person can go to that one location, whether it's online or it's an office, and to find out uh, everything that they owe. And because of that, um, you know, we've had during the trial, there was testimony that some clerk of courts, uh, which is in charge of keeping records of trials, uh, actually stored a lot of their files in shoe boxes, right? And that 
each clerk of court uh, in the different counties had their own way of conducting business, had their own data management systems, and it was not, uh, they were all not aligned with each other. And so it was, uh, it could be a challenge, I should say, for an individual to be able to determine uh, how much they owe. I mean, I'm a perfect example. You know, I am an advocate in the field. I've been involved with criminal justice for over 11 years. I have a law degree. And even I uh, missed some fines and fees that I owed. You know, I thought I had satisfied all of my legal financial obligations when I registered in January of 2019. But in the midst of an investigation, uh, because I had applied for a pardon, the investigators discovered that there were three or four cases in which, obscure cases, in which there was some kind of outstanding legal financial obligations. And so if I can miss it, then your average everyday uh, citizen, uh, returning citizen, uh, could quite possibly miss that as well. Thank you. So we had some students submit questions prior to tonight. And one of those questions is, you mentioned that it was difficult and it's a controversial topic to restore voting rights. How hard was it for you to gain a following in Florida? Wow. So it was hard. To, to get support. I mean, for a while, you know, we were basically on our own. Uh, there were a couple of years where we didn't have any money. And I remember some of our volunteers were taking their own sheets off their bed and going to a, a arts and crafts store and buying paint and actually painting our logo on a sheet uh, to use as a tablecloth to collect petitions. And so the early stages, it was very hard. And I think primarily because no one thought we had a chance to even uh, get this petition or get this amendment on the ballot. And, you know, they thought it was a waste of time. And so people went, or a lot of organizations went on their, their own ways and, and, and taking care of other things that they felt was either more important or just as important. And so we were left to our own devices. But as it relates to building a grassroots movement and building momentum uh, in support of Amendment 4, it really wasn't that hard to convince people. And it wasn't that hard to convince people who I was told would be totally against it. And to think the fact that we passed an amendment as controversial as the Amendment 4 was uh, with restoring voting rights, and we did not have one ounce of opposition, right? And, and I remember everybody thought that there's no way like Republicans are gonna allow you to pa the, uh, pass this without a fight uh, because, you know, if you restore 1.4 million people uh, right to vote, that's gonna turn Florida blue and you know, Republicans definitely don't want that. If you turn Florida blue, you would basically secure the White House uh, for generations. and. And so dark money would come against you and Republicans are gonna attack you and they're gonna use Willie Horton type ads against you, but none of that came. And I think one of the main reasons why none of that came was because we were courageous enough to not limit who we talk to or who can talk to us. And I found out that when we go to people, in spite of our differences, there are more that not binds us together as human beings, and we were able to bring them together along those lines. And so my, you know, I remember when I got the first petition out of the copier, once we had approval for circulation, the first place I went was to a conservative county. And it was during the election season. And I approached people that was wearing t-shirts that showed that they supported conservative candidates. And let me tell you, every last one of them signed my petition. Right, and, and one of the reasons why was, like I said, we wanted to make sure that we elevated our issue above partisan politics and above racial insecurities. And so it was a very simple question that I used, I used to ask people when I approached them. And it was, do you have anyone that you love who's ever made a mistake? Just that simple. 
And that was a question that you can ask anyone, no matter what their race was, no matter what their political preference was, no matter how old or young they were, you could ask everyone that very same question. And that question actually served as the foundation for the conversation that followed, right? And that was based in love. It was based in love. And, and I think that love transcends all of these barriers that we as humans uh, tend to erect with the labels and, and, and these titles and everything. And, and it, it kind of makes it more difficult for us to actually come together or come in proximity to each other. And so actually building that momentum, it was much easier than folks would think it was. That's so encouraging to hear. Thanks for sharing. Our next question is about the appeals court and their recent ruling as it relates to Amendment 4. Could you explain a little bit about that to everyone watching and talk about how your organization is responding? Yes. So, um, so basically, all right. So let me see if I could, uh, I could make this very succinct. When we pass amendment four, one of the requirements, uh, in order for a person to be able to, uh, register the vote was that they completed their sentence. Um, and apparently they are some, uh, financial obligations that are connected to uh, a person's sentence. And, and I generally divide them into two sets, right? There's, one set of financial obligations that are punitive in nature. That means that they are intimately connected to the crime that a person was convicted of. And you would typically see that in the form of a statutorily imposed fine, which means that there was a statute written that says, if you violate such and such, you face up to a certain amount of years in prison and a certain dollar amount in fines. And so when someone is sentenced, that judge may say, I sentence you to a year in prison, and I order you to pay a thousand dollar fine, right? That is punitive in nature. That's attached to a sentence. The other thing um, would be restitution. Uh, so I, in the, in the commission of my crime, I caused some damage to someone's personal property. It cost them a certain amount of money to uh, replace that property. I am ordered to pay that person restitution uh, to repair the harm that I've caused. Those are punitive. Uh, um, legal financial obligations. Then you have legal financial obligations that are administrative in nature and more or less of the cost of doing business in court, right? What happened was that the state legislature brought them all together and said, you have to pay all of it. And they codified it. And the minute they codified it, uh, ACLU, the Brennan Center for Justice, um, SPLC, Legal Defense Fund, they all filed lawsuits on behalf of about 16 uh, returning citizens, saying that this legislation that was passed uh, unnecessarily placed legal financial obligations as a requirement for people to be able to vote. And they, uh, they compared these financial obligations to a poll tax. Uh, after several months of trial, the... Um, the court, the trial court, which was in the Northern District of Florida, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, saying uh, that a lot of these costs and these, these fees were in fact poll taxes and were therefore unconstitutional. But the trial court went further and says that they recognize that there are some legal financial obligations that are connected to a person's sentence. However, a person's inability to pay that should not be a barrier to voting. In other words, you know, you being poor should not prevent you from being able to participate in our democracy. And so that was a great day in Florida, but it was short lived because not long after the state of Florida appealed to the 11th circuit and the 11th circuit court uh, just a few days ago, rendered a ruling that basically discarded everything that was said uh, during trial. And they basically, one of the things that stuck out more than anything is that they say that paying off fines and fees is a good indicator about whether or not somebody's qualified to be able to vote in this country. So they're basically saying that if you're too poor, you're not qualified to vote. And so when I look at the ruling uh, of the 11th Circuit, I see that 
as a blow to democracy. You know, it takes me back to uh, the Supreme Court case, Bush v. Gore, uh, when that election was decided in Florida by less than 600 votes. And ultimately the Supreme Court uh, ruled in favor of George Bush and basically gave him the, the presidency. I remember one of the dissenters, I can't remember uh, his name per se, but I remember when he said that while we may not clearly uh, know who the winner of the election is, we definitely know who the loser is. And the loser is the public's faith in the courts, right, to be impartial and to follow the rule of law. What we've seen in the 11th Circuit was definitely a ruling that was laid out strictly along partisan lines, right? And we know that, uh, that the rule of law was not followed. The spirit of democracy, which says that access to the voting booth should be unencumbered and free, that no one should ever have to pay to be able to vote. Uh, they totally ignored that. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but what we see, uh, once again, the consequences of voting or not voting. And um, all that has done is strengthen our resolve to continue the fight and to continue to operate under the existing law, which allows us to utilize the courts to waive a person fines and fees and for us to continue raising money through our fines and fees fund, which we've raised over $5 million and we've paid out over $4 million in fines and fees to help people um, satisfy their legal financial obligations and register to vote. Our next question is a little broader. Uh, what do you think about the current state of the Black Lives Matter movement? And do you think the energy from that movement will transfer into the voting booth in November? Wow, those are two broad questions. Let me see. Um, I'm writing this down so I won't forget. So let me, let me talk to you about Black Lives Matter movement because I think so much of what we do in, 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 in life, you know, and, and even if, you, if it's in education, even if it's in criminal justice, it could be, uh, you could be an advocate for the environment or for immigration or for many other things. I think uh, what's really important in, in advocacy and the work that we do is making sure that we control the narrative, right? The narrative is so, so important. You know, um, trust me, I'm gonna get to the answer, but I wanna, I wanna take it this way for a minute. One of my friends, he's a professor at Montgomery College. He wrote a book about African-Americans against the atomic bomb. That's the title of it. And it talks about the African-Americans community response to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and how African-Americans were terrified. Because it was like, wow, if the United States can just wipe out like cities of people like that, I mean, what would they do to us, right, uh, as African-Americans? And one of the, um, in one of the chapters in that book, it talks about how the United States engaged in the propaganda campaign prior to dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they, they depicted Japanese people as evil devils, uh, people that would murder our kids and uh, rape our wives and daughters and just destroy our communities. And they really demonized uh, um, the, uh, the Japanese people. And, th and they did so, right, to desensitize us while dehumanizing the Japanese. So when they did drop the bomb, it wasn't a great moral outrage that we could just take the lives of people just so wantonly, right? And, and it kind of reminds me of even the narrative of around African Americans that we're dangerous people, that we're, that we're evil and, you know, um, we're super predators. All of these narratives serve to dehumanize um, African Americans and dehumanize people with felony convictions, all right? We use the word ex-felon and ex-con, which we don't use, we use returning citizens. But by using those type of, of words, we desensitize and we uh, create a other set of, uh, 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 of beings. And, and so we don't associate with those criminals and, and, and they're lower than us. And so we're not like 
pissed off or we're not shocked by the prison conditions. We're not shocked by the disparity in sentencing and the over-policing in minority communities. That doesn't piss us off because we've been conditioned to believe that these guys, people that commit crime are not deserving of the type of a dignity and respect that we as law-abiding citizens deserve, which that's a farce because I don't know any one of us that's perfect. And we've all done something wrong. We just haven't gotten caught. I say all that to say, and that was my long way. I'm an attorney, forgive me. But I say all that to say this. One of the areas where we fell short was allowing a narrative to fester that totally, totally mischaracterized Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> and <clears throat> out of that Black Lives Matter movement came responses like Blue Lives Matter, which that doesn't make sense, and White Lives Matter, and All Lives Matter. And people did not truly understand what Black Lives Matter really meant and did not, was not able to put it into context because I don't think it was properly put into context for us to really truly appreciate what Black Lives Matter meant. And so, uh, Kaylee, I'm glad you answered that question because I want to use you as an example, if you don't mind. You know, and so, Kaylee, you're, you're jogging, you know, you're, you're jogging, doing your early morning jog, right, in the park, and you twist your ankle, right? The minute you twist your ankle, uh, uh, your ankle sends these, like, electro neuro messages to your brain basically saying something is wrong down here, right? And you're experiencing pain. That, that, that message has been transmitted through the entire body. The entire body is alerted that there's something wrong with your ankle. Now, when you twist your ankle and that ankle sends that message saying, I'm in pain, your elbow is not going to say, but I'm important too. You know, your nose is not going to say, but I'm important too. Right, your hand is not gonna say, Hey, but I'm just as important, right? No, all the attention is now directed to the part of your body that's in pain. And what Black Lives Matter was saying was that we are a part of a body, and it's a part, there's a part of our body that's now in pain, that we've been in pain, that something is wrong here, and we need your attention. Because if we don't get your attention, if you don't give attention, to that sprained ankle, then what happens, not only do it become worse, but it impacts the other parts of your body. And before you know it, you're walking wrong, and now your back is getting thrown out. And now when your back is wrong, then you're having even more internal problems, or you're having problems with your knees now, right? And so basically what Black Lives Matter was saying was that we are, as African Americans, are part of the body of the human race. We're a part of it. And we know that there's so many parts to our body and that no part is, we're not saying that any part is more special than the other. But what we're saying is that this particular part of the body of the human race is suffering, is in pain, is experiencing trauma, and we need attention to this now. And, and, and um, unfortunately, what has happened over the years is that America has tried to put a little wrap little ace bandage around the uh, ankle and say, okay, you, should, you ought to be okay. Uh, but the thing is, is that when you try to run, Kaylee, you find out that there's still, there's something deeper that's wrong and the ace bandage is not going to fix it. That we have to go deeper into this. And Black Lives Matter was the way to really sound the clarion that there is a deeper issue that we cannot just brush over, right? There's a deeper issue that we cannot just ignore. Because if we're not right, then how could the rest of the body be right, right? And it's not a competition. And I think that um, a lot of that was lost at the very beginning. And one of the reasons, probably because we're a hashtag society and, and we don't, you know, we take the hashtags and run with it. But I believe what we are seeing today, you know, as it relates to, to Black Lives Matter, could possibly be bastardized, but it have the potential to actually take us to a different level. And I, I think that the hope for that lies in the young people that have actually been leading these movements and they've been very, very consistent with it. 
But I would challenge people to not just jump on a Black Lives Matter uh, bandwagon because it sounds good and everybody's doing it. They did that with when Trayvon Martin passed away, right? When he was murdered and, and everybody was, I am Trayvon. You know, even white people were able to say, I am Trayvon Martin, right? It became so easy for people to do. And I thought that we missed a great moment there because the rallying cry should not have been, I am Trayvon. The rallying cry should have been, I am George Zimmerman, right? Because that rallying cry of, I am George Zimmerman, would have forced us to think deeper into a society where even me as a black man would have profiled Trayvon Martin. It would have forced me to have that conversation about why me as an African-American man would not feel threatened when a white guy is walking towards me, but I would feel threatened when a black guy in baggy pants, uh, or maybe with gold teeth and maybe with dreads, walk to me. What is it about our society that has caused us to fear our own? It caused us to fear people because of the color of their skin and how they may dress. And that was the deeper question that we really needed to ask in order to start the healing process of the part of our body that's been screaming out in pain for so many centuries. But we cannot attend to that pain if we're only looking to put a Band-Aid over it. If we're only looking to take the easy way out. When you mess your knee up, there's no easy way out around rehabilitating your knee. And there's not going to be an easy way out to rehabilitating the trauma that's been caused by this country and afflicted on African Americans. Thank you. I love the ankle analogy. That was great. We've had a couple questions about the right to vote. Um, so our listeners want to know, why do you think we're selective about which aspects of citizenship we withhold? And what's the root of why returning citizens lose their right to vote in the first place? Oh, okay. Well, I can answer both questions, right? At the end of the day, uh, which felon disenfranchisement really saw uh, its resurgence during uh, the Reconstruction era, uh, after the slaves were freed. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know any better way but to tell a story. I know time is running short, but it's a, to me, I think it's a great story. And you have to, and it helps you to understand people, right? And we just can't uh, uh, cut people off and not talk to them because they may seem to not agree with us or they may seem to be against us, right? And that we have to really, uh, what I learned in, 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 in drug treatment was that you hate the disease, not the person, right? And God teaches us to love each other in spite of their hatred for us, in spite of what they may be trying to do against us, that we love each other. And so one of the, pros one of the ways to do that is really, to really try to understand. And when you stop and think that you know, this country uh, was engaged in slavery for over three generations, over 300 years, uh, 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 white slave owners were taught by their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents that black people were less than human, that we were animals, that it's okay to, 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 to beat us until the flesh uh, uh, comes off our body. It's okay to rape our women and our men, destroy families and kill them. It's okay to treat black people like they're worse than dogs because guess what? They're not even a whole human being. That they're savages that need to be, uh, that you need to keep your foot on. But all of a sudden, this white slave owner whose father, grandfather, and great-grandfather instilled in him how superior he was to African Americans. He wake up one day to the news that those same people that he despised uh, have the same rights that he does, right? And not only that, that they started exercising those rights and they started becoming sheriffs. They started becoming congressmen. They started becoming mayors, right? And, and that was a scary situation because the same people, that same person who just became sheriff, right? I raped his mother, right? Or I sold his, his sister off to slavery. I killed his dad. I killed his great granddad. I, I, I beat his great grandmother. And he knows I've done that to him. I've whipped him, right? I've beat him to the flesh all the way to the bone. And now he's sheriff. Now he's mayor. And, and, and so the fear of retribution really caused a lot of the 
white slave owners to come up with these uh, 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 um, Jim Crow laws, right, that come up with creative ways to strip uh, the newly freed slaves of the right to vote or terrorize them into not ex exercising the right to vote. And so you had the slave patrols, which are now, uh, ironically, the police, right? But the slave patrols was used to exact terror on the newly freed slaves to scare them from voting. And then if, you, if they couldn't scare them, they erected literacy tests, poll taxes, all kinds of mechanisms to keep people from being able to vote. And one of the ways that they did it that was ingenious was through felon disenfranchisement. So they created laws that they figured the newly freed slaves were more likely to commit. And they uh, um, codified those laws and, and allowed those laws to strip a person of the right to vote. For instance, in some states, you would, get, you would lose the right to vote for hitting your wife, but you wouldn't lose the right to vote for killing your wife, right? And so when you strip these people of the, the right to vote and you criminalize things such as loitering or vagrancy, you take these people, strip them of the right to vote, you throw them in prison, and then you outsource them as prison labor right back to the same fields that they was just liberated from. And so it was an ingenious and, and, and calculated plan uh, uh, to, to minimize uh, the effectiveness of the newly freed slaves and to minimize their access to democracy and to keep the powers that be in place. And we see that even today um, playing out, even with the prison uh, industrial complex. We see it playing out with the school to prison pipeline. We see it pay, play it out with voter ID laws and all kinds of voter suppression tactics. And you definitely see it play out with intimidation, um, where, where these false allegations of voter fraud, or like in Ferguson, uh, where police officers would would uh, hang around voting locations to check people's uh, status to see if there are out, any outstanding warrants. And so, uh, unfortunately, that you know, though that was the reason why these laws were created. And um, thankfully, uh, we were able to to knock down that 150 year old Jim Crow wall in Florida and create an opportunity for margin people in marginalized communities to finally retake the power that they rightfully own, right? And this is an opportunity uh, to actually be a catalyst to the rest of the country and to even people who've never lost their rights but have no uh, um, appreciation for the right to vote, for people who won't even go vote, people who won't even register, to hopefully this would serve as a catalyst to let people know that the right to vote is valuable and we honor that right by actually voting. So we have about five minutes left, so this will be our final question. And it's, what would you invite us to do? Um, how could we support your work? How would you encourage people in Kentucky and other places to dive into this area of work? So in Kentucky, um, I think after we passed Amendment 4, you have got, had got a new governor that decided that he was going to uh, sign an executive order that restored voting rights back to the tens of thousands of returning citizens. And I would suggest really connecting with an organization in Kentucky. Uh, I think Free Hearts is one of them. Uh, I can't think of the other one now, uh, the uh, Kentucky Alliance. Uh, but to connect with organizations to help register uh, returning citizens. You know, uh, one of the verses in the Bible that always stick with me is, is one that says, so much of you have done for the least among you, that's what you've done to me. I believe that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I believe that the same applies to our society, that if we want our society or our community to be great, then we must do all we can to empower those that are weakest in our communities and society. And returning citizens fall into that category. And so, you can help by doing that. Now, if you want to throw down in Florida with us, you know, you can always, on your cell phones, you can always text the word F-E-E-S to the number 82623. Number 82623, text the keyword F-E-E-S, and that gives you an opportunity 
to donate to our fines and fees fund so we can help people who are too poor to be able to afford these legal finance obligations um, pay their fines and fees off so they can participate in our elections. And then the last thing I'll say, um, I'll be voting uh, in this presidential election, I believe the first time in over 30 years. Um, and um, when I voted a couple of weeks ago in the primaries, I realized, I come to realize that voting, the act of voting is a sacred act and that we should understand that the sacredness of it really does transcend partisan politics um, because it really says that you are, that I am. I am a human being and my voice does count, it does matter. And I wanna tell folks that um, at the end of the day, you know, we would want as many people as possible to participate in elections because that creates a more vibrant democracy, which is good for everyone. And, and so much as you've done to the least among you, that's what you've done uh, to me. And I close by saying that if you're thinking about how do you wanna change anything, like the prison reform system or whatever it is, I challenge you to ask yourself a simple question. How would I want the system to treat someone that I love? When you talk about how to reform criminal uh, uh, juvenile justice system, well, what if my son would have made a mistake? What type of system would I want to be in place for him, right? What if my mother, what if my sister uh, 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 broke a law, had a drug problem? How would I want them to be treated? And I think that when you, when you really give that some serious thought, and I believe that the things that you would want for the people who you love the most, then that should be the system that you should advocate for, for everyone. Thank you all once again. I enjoyed your questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, doing this again, hopefully in person. Thank you so much, Desmond. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, this, this was, wow, this was just a, a great one hour lesson. Uh, and I can't wait to have you here on campus when it's safe. And thank you so much. I wanna thank Kaylee for being such a wonderful moderator. I wanna thank our technology guys for making this happen. And uh, thank you so much again, Desmond, for, for all, of, all of this, what you've told us. And uh, good luck to you. And as you, I know you have a packed schedule, you're on next very soon. And uh, good luck to all of the things that are ahead of you. And uh, wow. So. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to another one. We'll do that. That's promised. Have a good evening. Good night.